understand how the Atlanteans were suppressed in the human 1.0 because of the implants, but why did they go there? If they didn't volunteer as you suggest, how did they get forced into slavery when they were previously these powerful, sovereign beings? We don't know exactly how it happened. The record we read was not specific on this topic. But the tone, or word that was used, was that the Atlanteans were naive. They had no reason to think it would be possible to become enslaved. It would be like a concept that was never used in their culture. No one ever did that nor could they. You could enslave an infinite being, unless, of course, you locked them into a human uniform. And that was the cunning of the Anunnaki and their Syrian partners. They launched this attack from such a bizarre angle, that the Atlanteans couldn't see it coming. I think it was an ambush or surprise attack. You said earlier that the human 2.0 could reproduce. How long of a time existed between 1.0 and 2.0, and what were their primary differences? Human 1.0 rose to a pretty high level in terms of being able to speak or communicate. That was the major add-on that Marduk brought to Human 1.0. However, the psychological state of being a clone was too hard for Human 1.0. They all looked alike and had the same thoughts, so communication was helpful to a point, for example, coordinating a task, but actually having individual ideas no. And this led to depression and psychological states where, according to the wing makers, they literally went mad. This flaw was a huge problem. Anu decided to wipe them out, and this is the story of the Great Flood. Marduk managed to save some of the Human 1.0s from the Flood along with other flora and fauna, but it was the end of Human 1.0. Human 2.0 was then created. This was the stage where the humans could self-reproduce. And when this happened, some of the Anunnaki impregnated female humans and brought in their bloodlines to the human species. This began the variations. This began the idea that humans were no longer clones. The concern, however, was that human 2.0s might become too powerful and self-aware. What if the Atlantean power source became aware that it was an infinite being? This was when Anu decided that he should be God. Humans needed to have a lord or ruler over them so it was clear that they were inferior to an external ruler. This was a key part of their program of indoctrination. Working with Marduk and the Syrians, they created the environment of Eden and created the paradigm of Eve as the instigator of the fall of humanity. This was, you might say, Act 1 of Anu as God. It was staged to provide the human 2.0s with a clear sense of an external authority, and that they were expelled from paradise because they tried to be self-realized. It was like rebuking humanity with the fist of an angry creator who wanted his creation to remain identified with their human uniform. Kind of like saying, do not think for a moment that you can be like me. And the wingmakers wrote that this actually happened kind of like the Bible said? Yes. So the God of the Bible is this Anunnaki Lord, called on you? Yes. Why are you telling me this all now? It seems like this information changes some of the previous information you've shared. To really understand the Grand Portal, you have to understand this evolutionary process, and the only way you can understand it is to go back to the beginning of the human race. So why did Anu want to be God? Remember that the original goal was the acquisition of gold. But when the Atlanteans rejected Anu, he began to conspire with the Syrians. It was just before the flood that Anu discovered that the gold he mined was sufficient. He didn't require more. However, the notion of being a god over the Atlanteans was seductive. The Syrians and serpents felt that the idea of enslaving infinite beings and planet ecosystems was their invention. They had something that was totally unique. They were creator gods, and every other race could be ensnared in a similar type of vessel. They began to do just that. You mean enslave other races? Yes. You see the Earth had a unique quality to its core. This core was of extreme interest to the Anunnaki when they first visited Earth. It was this core that created the gravitational field that enabled the planet to become fully physical in such a way that it could support physical life. Of course other conditions needed to be present, too, but it was this core that was the real key. Working with the Syrians and serpents, they began to do the same enslavement on other planets. They replicated the core of Earth and engineered a method for implanting this core on other planets. They were essentially terraforming a planet by cloning and installing Earth's core. So I guess the real question is, if you believe this, what are humans today? Are we simply more of the same? Are we human 2.0? When I said the human uniform evolves, it does, but this evolution is on a track, a pre-programmed track. The intent was to have Anu return on a cloud, the whole second coming was going to be the stage entrance for Anu. Humanity would evolve in such a way that his re-entry into our consciousness would be understood to be a good thing. Humanity's salvation. We would all be his children, and the glory of God would be upon the earth. That was the plan. From before the time of Jesus, 
That was the plan. Marduk programmed the entire How long can these beings live? Again, the beings like Marduk or Enki or Anu are not based in space-time. They are infinite beings, meaning they have no end. They don't have an age. Neither do we. I'm trying to wrap my mind around all of this, but I'm finding it very hard to believe that human beings are simply uniforms for a programmed existence. Let me go back to your previous question about what humanity is now. The functional implants of the human interface are perfectly integrated within the human vessel. They operate seamlessly. So seamlessly, we do not know that they are not us. We have no choice in the way. We think our thoughts and emotions are us, that this space-time is what our thoughts and emotions exist in. Even the thought of the God, Heaven, Hell, Soul, Masters, all of these things, they are part of the program. It is integrated in both the dimension of the Earth plane and the afterlife. The afterlife is part of a deception. Tell me more about this interface and its functional implants. The I brain was the key element that the Anunnaki needed to design to make the functional implants operate. This is in Human 1.0. In Human 2.0 it was the DNA. Once this was achieved, the Syrians could design the consciousness framework, the human consciousness. Human consciousness is the key to suppressing an infinite being. Human consciousness, or the triad of consciousness is composed of three interactive layers. The first layer is universal mind or unconscious, and this forms the link between the individual human and the entire species. This layer is what enables all of us to see what everyone sees, feel what everyone else feels, know what everyone else knows. It is the perfect way to unify a species in separation. In fact, that is the way we feel unification, through the unconscious mind. The next layer of consciousness is the genetic mind, as the wing makers refer to it, or subconscious, in the case of Sigmund Freud. This forms the link between the individual and their family tree or genetics. This is where bloodlines are expressed. And then there is the conscious mind. This is the unique individual perception and expression, what most of us call our personality and character, which is built on this layer. The conscious mind of the individual is heavily influenced by the genetic mind, especially between birth and the age of seven or eight. By that time the influence is all-encompassing. Remember that the Anunnaki created the biological form, the body, the Syrians created the functional implants, and Marduk executed the programming of these functional implants so they would evolve along a program path, leading to the return of Anu. This was expressed in the hierarchical structure of humanity that speaks of God and Masters in religious and esoteric texts. This was all part of the design to create various religions and esoteric cults that would support a vast hierarchy and order the human species into master-student relationships, and then create a multi-leveled afterlife that would reward those who believed and were obedient to their god or masters. You see, the whole principle that was behind this entire endeavor could be summed up in one word, separation. Everything exists in separation, within the earth plane and its afterlife planes as well. But, according to the wing makers, what is real is that we are all imbued with equality and oneness, not through the unconscious mind, which only links us in separation, but rather through the life essence that is us. And this life essence is sovereign and integral. It is I am we are. No one is above, no one is below. No one is better, no one is lesser. But you're saying everything is a lie? Everything I mean everything we've been taught to believe in is a deception. How is that possible, or, or even believable? It's possible because the beings that have enslaved humanity designed a world, to which we adjusted over eons of time. We evolved into it in such a manner that we became lost in our world. The veils that have been placed over us are opaque. So much so that people operate as human uniforms unaware that everything around them is illusory. It is a programmed reality that is not real. The wing makers say everything is simply sound holographically organized to look real. It's depressing. Only when you consider the scope of the deception and the way in which humanity has allowed it to rule their behaviors. The good news is that you're hearing about this now. It doesn't feel like good news. Each person can step out of the illusion. There is no master here. No god is going to come down and make it happen for us. No ETs. No one. It is each of us. This is what is meant by I am. I, it's like one. One, me, and one, all of us unified. M, meaning exists now. In this moment. Not in history or memory. Not in some future time or goal. Now. It doesn't feel real to me. I was raised a Christian. 
I have no reason to believe that Jesus was an inside agent for this plan of deception. I'm not saying he was. Many of those who have come to earth as human teachers have tried to reveal how deep and broad and high this illusion has been made. It is as far as the edge of the universe and as close as your DNA. Everywhere in between is illusion. Jesus came to reveal much of this, but the writers of the Bible decided what would be acceptable within the paradigm of life as we humanly know it. They elected to make Jesus a part of a deception. They saw it was time for a redefinition of God to accommodate an evolving human 2.0. God was suddenly a loving father, and all of humanity was brother and sister. So you're saying Jesus was aware of this deception, but his words weren't included in the Bible? Our opinion was that his words were so against the conditioned beliefs that people could not understand them as he said them. And so, over time, they were translated into the form you know them today. The biblical translation simply lacked the original potency with which he said them. Besides, there are two methods that can make exposing this illusion a very difficult proposition. What do you mean? The first is that the unconscious mind system is inside everyone. It's like a field of information that everyone can access. It can affect or infect everyone. A revelatory idea can be passed to a small number of people, but it lacks sufficient influence to generate mass awakening. So there's unconscious mind inertia. The other, and this is more pernicious, is that the functional implants are programmed, and like any program, they can be upgraded or even turned off. As I listen to this story, I, I feel a little overwhelmed at how to proceed with the interview. I'm not sure what to ask or what direction to take things. If I look at my notes, I see my handwritten note, there is no God, is this really what you're saying? The wing makers refer to the triad of consciousness as having the God consciousness installed within it in the unconscious mind layer. But they also report that as the individual develops from about the age of six or seven, they begin to assemble their individual personality from the elements of the subconscious layer. By the time they're 12 to 14 years old, they have their unique personality well in place. For some, this uniqueness is shutting out the existence of a god. From Anu's perspective, this is fine. He probably likes having atheists and agnostics. It's more separation more diversity. In fact, the greater the diversity in the human family, the greater the separation. The greater the separation, the easier it is to keep the program of enslavement intact. Choose sides and disagree with your opponents. Compete. It fuels wars and social unrest. As for the existence of God, we, collectively, are the closest thing to God. We are. That's the clear message of the wing makers. There is a first source, the creator of the life essence, a center point in existence that created the framework of existence through sound. But what about the ones who are enlightened or spiritual masters? They're all made up. No, it's not that they're made up. They exist. It's just that their existence is within the human interface or functional implants. They exist there. We, us, the being that is I am, that being is not of that reality. It doesn't really exist inside the holographic stage that was created by interdimensional beings millions of years ago. Rather, it is being used as a power source that animates the human interface or uniform. Over time, we've spiraled deeper and deeper inside of this created world, complete with its afterlife and different planes of existence. You could look at it this way, Anu installed a program inside the human 2.0 and in this program, humans would evolve from knowing absolutely nothing about their world. To knowing God. Humans were designed to have God consciousness, meaning, to have the same understanding and awareness as Anu. But then Anu took this evolutionary line and positioned God consciousness so far out into the future that humans would essentially be chasing this God consciousness forever. They'd be chasing shadows, because until they awaken from the deception, the only God that exists in that world is Anu. Once awakened as I am, we are, or the sovereign integral, a human being lives as an expression of this consciousness. According to the wing makers, no one has achieved this at this time. It is, however, our future to live in this consciousness in a human instrument. No one has done this, you mean anywhere? On this plane, Earth, no one has done this. But remember, the wing makers are human in a future time. They have returned to our time to crack the shell open a bit. They have traveled to our time to remind us of what they discovered. They left this enslavement, so we will do it. But you already said that space-time is an illusion. That's true. It is, 
but it's hard to imagine that the universe in which we exist is really a hologram projection, that was programmed inside our unconscious mind, and we're really inside this hologram, wearing a human uniform that was outfitted to perceive only this hologram. The wing makers say that the real world is sound. Everything is sound and resonance of sound. 